Hey everyone, and welcome to the AI show. I am Cassie Brevue. I will be your host today, and we have a lot of fun content. So the first part, we're going to be looking at what's new with Form Recognizer, and that will be with uh, Seth and Vinod. Um, we'll take a break for questions, and I'll also ask your questions in the chat during the video. We'll have people there to get all those answered. Um, and then after that, we're going to start with our second video, which I'll be joined by Jessica and Parnita. And we are going to be talking about the ACPT or the Azure container for PyTorch. So let's jump right in with our first video. And actually, let me take a look who's hanging out. If you want to say hello in the chat and tell us where you're, you're watching from, that's always fun to see uh, who's hanging out with us today. So I will jump right in. You're not, You're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI show. We're going to talk about the latest from Azure Form Recognizer with my friend Vinod. Make sure you tune in. Hello and welcome to this episode of the AI show. We're talking about the latest from Azure Form Recognizer with our friend Vinod Kirpad. How you doing, my friend? Why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, thanks, Seth. It's great to be on the show. I'm Vinod Karpat. I'm a product manager uh, working on Form Recognizer. Uh, and really excited to be here today to talk to you about all the new things that we're releasing within Form Recognizer with the new 3.0 GA API. Fantastic. OK, so let's just set a level playing field here. For those that don't know about Form Recognizer, can you give us a 30 second elevator pitch? Definitely. So Form Recognizer has a number of different capabilities. Think about it as starting with OCR, you can extract all the, the content that you want from any of the document types that you're dealing with. Uh, we even support a few different office type documents, for example, uh, uh, Word and PowerPoint. Those are still preview features, but, but those are available for you to use within Form Recognizer today. Uh, in, in, the, in the GA version of the API, we, we support PowerPoint as an example. Uh, I'm sorry, we support PDF documents and uh, or, or images. And so you can extract text and, uh, and content from each of those different types of documents that you're dealing with. As you go up the stack of form recognizer capabilities, you can extract a number of different semantic elements from the document as well. Things like layout, tables, selection marks, uh, you know, paragraphs, paragraph rows. Those are all sort of capabilities that we have as part of the layout API. Uh, if you go further up, you can uh, even use the general document API, which is think about it as a document agnostic model that, that extracts key value pairs from a document. You know, you have a number of these common uh, types of forms. For example, you fill out a form at a doctor's office where, you know, there's a number of different questions, which is like, you know, your name, age, date of birth, you know, like uh, past symptoms and things like that. And it's able to process some of these documents without really needing you to build any sort of a custom model because it can extract all the different key value pairs that you need from each of these different document types that you can use in your automation workflows. Um, and then moving on, we have a, a few really specific document specific models, which are things like uh, an invoice model or a receipt model. We even have released now a W2 model as well as health insurance cards. And so we have a number of these different pre-built model types which are really targeted at extracting the specific key value pairs that you expect to see in each of these different document types. Uh, yeah. And finally, if, if none of these uh, sort of address any of your needs, we have a set of custom capabilities and we have two different types of custom models that you can use. One is called a template model, which is essentially intended for documents that have a very fixed and defined visual template. And then we have a new neural model now, which is also part of our GA release. And, and neural models allow you to extract data from unstructured documents as well. So you can extract, for example, tables, layout information, as well as key value pairs from unstructured documents. And so Form Recognizer is intended to serve all of your document automation and document processing needs, starting from simple text extraction all the way to really specific document type sort of scenarios that you might want to deal with. And this is really cool because it, like, it's not OCR is at the base. It's not just OCR. And then you have structure and then you have specific structure and then you have generic structure to whatever it is that you want to do. Am I getting this right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's perfect, right? Because essentially what we have is, is, is uh, I like to describe it as three sets of capabilities, right? So you have OCR, which is essentially extracting text from a document. Then you have these document agnostic models, which are really intended to extract structure as well as key value pairs from a document, but Got they don't it. really care whether it's a document of uh, whether it's a receipt, an invoice, or, or a W2 uh, or, or a contract, right? So it's it's all it's all the same for, from a from a document agnostic model perspective. Um, and finally, we have these document specific model types, right? Which are 
which are either pre-built document model types, which are essentially a model that, that Microsoft's trained based on data we've acquired, which are things like the invoice, W2, and, and things like that. Or you could go bring your own data, label it, and use a custom model to extract those uh, those key value pairs or fields that you're looking for from these documents. I love it. So what's the latest? So I know there's got to be some kind of announcement that you're making. What's the latest uh, since we've talked last? Yeah, so I think what I'd like to do is actually walk you through uh, a quick update of what uh, what's contained in the new 3.0 generally available API, because this API is now generally available and it, it's got a lot of functionality that we've added in, uh, essentially a number of different things that we've done over the past year. So let me share my screen and and, and walk you through what, what we're talking about here. Let's do I, it. Your screen is shared and we're ready to go. Let's take a look. Perfect. So I'm going to start off by talking primarily about the studio first, right? And the studio is essentially the, uh, the best experience that you can have with Form Recognizer today. We've taken a lot of the feedback that you had about like the sample labeling tool and things like that in the past and, and really revamped the experience in the studio. Uh, so the studio allows you to do three specific things, right? First is you can explore each of the different model types, right? So uh, as a simple example, I can go ahead and click on read here. Uh, this will open the read API. I can go ahead and click analyze. Uh, and now I have a few sample documents here that I can choose from, or I could bring my own document in uh, and, and upload a, a specific document that I want to try this out with and get the outputs from each of these models. So you can see here that in addition to sort of like the uh, sample documents that I've got, I've got the output now, um, and you can see I've got each of these paragraphs identified and, and I can take each of the content elements that I want from here. Uh, so the studio, for example, is a great way for you to go try out each of these models. So, so let's go take, take a look at layout because layout is another model that, that got updated as part of our V3 API. And Layout, if you remember uh, from, from prior years, if you've used layout in the past, it usually extracts uh, text, selection marks, as well as uh, 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 tables. With this new update, you'll notice that layout now does something a lot more specific, right? So if you think about all the challenges you have with uh, document segmentation and finer grain detail within a document, you can get those answers to, to some of the questions that you have about documents you're dealing with. So we tell you what the paragraphs are, but we also give you a specific role for each of these paragraphs. So you can see in this case, uh, the paragraph for the news today is essentially a type of type, is a title type of, uh, of paragraph. So, so you're, you're not only are you getting all of the paragraphs identified, but you're also getting each of the roles associated with, with those paragraphs. In addition to that, obviously layout also does all the things that it's been doing for, for, the, for, for the last few years, which is extracting uh, selection marks as well as tables. And we're continuing to improve that experience as well, right? So, for example, you can get, uh, you know, tables as an example of of, of things so cool. that tabular data. It's just get extracted out of the document with no real training required, right? So, this is just a layout model doing its thing at this point. This is um, this is amazing. So, I, before you go, basically, yeah. this is a place where someone can go and just try it out on any kind of document to see what the base stuff does, and it does analysis of unstructured and structured documents, correct? Exactly, right? Uh, so, so Seth, you hit, the, you hit the nail on the head. The studio is essentially a, a, think of it as a playground, right? So you can go in, you know, select a particular model that you want to try out, uh, analyze a specific document. Like I said, you could, you could use one of the sample documents that are in the studio, or you could go ahead and bring in your own document, analyze it, validate that the results that the model is able to produce meets your expectations, and, and that's what you'd want to use. And, and not just that, right? The studio takes it one step further because it actually shows you what the result is in JSON as well and gives you a sample example of how you might want to use uh, one of the uh, language specific SDK elements. Uh, in this case, this is a Python sample that walks you through how you might want to use uh, this particular model using the, using the SDK in anything that you're building as an application for yourself. Love it. Yeah, so uh, the, the general document example here that I have on the screen walks you through uh, the capabilities of the general document model, which is essentially extracting key value pairs from each of these different documents, right? Uh, so like, like I mentioned earlier, this is a pre-trained model. You don't need to train anything. It just understands documents and is able to extract all the different key value pairs that it's able to find from within each of these documents. Uh, there's a few other examples. You, you're welcome to go ahead and give it a try. Uh, but that's essentially the Form Recognizer Studio in a nutshell. It gives you all of these different capabilities, but but it brings out 
each of these things in a way that's that's really easy for you to to try out, validate that it works, and then take it and productionize it within within the applications that you're building. Awesome, awesome. And now this is the, now GA'd, so anyone can can use this. Is this correct? That's correct. So, it's, so, so there's two real components that that I want to talk about, right? Okay. The studio itself is how you how you interact with the with the form recognizer resource or the form recognizer APIs, uh, and then there's the underlying APIs itself, right? So obviously the studio is GA. So are the underlying APIs, and so we just talked a little bit about the studio. Let's let's sort of like dive into each of the different capability areas, maybe, and, and spend a couple minutes like walking through some of the updates because there's a lot to unpack here in terms of like all the different updates that that are available with the form recognizer today. Let's do it. Let's dive in. Right. Uh, so like like we just looked at the general document model, like think of this as a a really good start to analyzing any any specific document type. Right. So you can bring in any document that has key value pairs or form fields in it, uh, click analyze. And now you're able to to get the output that describes each of the different key value pairs that are extracted as part of this document. Uh, so you'll see here that, that for example, you know, if, as, as I hover over some of these key value pairs, you'll see. Uh, the proposed start date, as well as the, the specific value and so forth, right? So each of these elements is now extracted for you without you having to do anything more than essentially just submit this document as an API request to the API. So that's key value pairs or, or, or general document model. Uh, this model continues to improve. It can, it can today extract all the things that layout can, as well as these key value pairs. So for example, you'll see that you, uh, some of these things like, like tables that are extracted as part of the layout are also available as part of the output. But in addition to the output from layout, you are, you're getting the key value pairs as well. That's you awesome. also have selection marks. And so you can see whether each of these selection marks are selected or unselected. And, and that's something that that is just native to the model. It, it's just able to extract all this uh, information from any of these document types that, that it's processing. Um, in addition to this, uh, the, the, the key area that I wanted to really highlight in terms of what's new with, uh, with uh, the new 3.0 API is we've now added a new model type called the custom neural model. And custom neural models are different from uh, traditional uh, custom template models that you've trained in the past because they really enable you to use form recognizer with unstructured documents. Uh, so as an example, I'll walk you through a quick uh, sort of a labeling example of like what, what we typically do is uh, you need to come into the Form Recognizer Studio, set up a new project, go ahead and label a few documents for, for what you're trying to extract, right? And the labeling process is super simple. It's, it's intuitive. All you need to do is go select the text that you want and go ahead and label the document, right? So let me let me show you what that experience looks like. Um, I'm going to zoom in just a little bit uh, so, so we get a better view of, of what's going on here. Uh, you'll see that I have a few different labels. I can create a new label in here. Uh, for example, if I want to create a new field, uh, that, that might be something like payment terms. Um, I can go ahead and create a new field called payment terms, and you'll see it's, it's, it's probably added to the bottom of the list here. Uh, you can also reorder this list and move things around if you wanted to. So I, I can go ahead and, and do that, and I'll move payment terms up here. And uh, I don't know if there's any payment terms in this particular document, but let's assume that uh, there was something that I needed to label. Uh, it's just a question of essentially highlighting the text that I really want to, to label uh, and then selecting the, the specific field that I want to label it as. And so you'll see that that, that particular uh, term got, uh, th the particular field got labeled with the value that I'm looking for. Uh, and essentially it's a question of doing this for as, as few as five documents. And that should then enable you to train a, a custom journal model. Uh, so in this case, it's the, what I'm dealing with is a few different contracts. Um, and you can see that each of these contracts are different because they're all sort of like with a completely different structure, diff different uh, style, uh, written by probably different entities. And as a result, are, are significantly different. Uh, but I'm still extending uh, this. I'm still using the exact same model to extract the the key value pairs that I'm really interested in, in this case, like what are the different parties? Uh, and I'm also trying to do some things around clause identification as well to, to really extract some clauses. So uh, this, you know, with this, I can go ahead and label a doc label as few as five documents, go ahead and uh, train a model. And let's go look at what the experience looks like when, uh, when I have a model trained, I can go and uh, now I'm gonna try to analyze a particular document. So I'm gonna go find a document here that I can use to analyze. Uh, this is a document that I used with the same training data set, but it's not something that, that the model has ever seen before. So it's not, not a document that the model is 
uh, has, has ever looked at. And when I when I go ahead and use that document and analyze it, I will get a similar set of results like what we saw when we were using the general document model, for example, right? So you'll see that I can get all the different key value pairs that I, were, I was able to identify as part of the, the label data set. But I also get all of the things that were sort of part of the model from, for example, from layout as well as uh, the read options, right? Uh, so it's essentially, think of it as a aggregation uh, of models. So so what you're looking at is is, is a combination of the, the output from both read, layout, as well as the custom model that I'm running here. And this is cool um, because this is really unstructured data. Yeah. It's not, it's, that's the coolest part. This is yeah, exactly right. So, so each of these document types was different. You know, th this particular document, for example, that we we just analyzed is significantly different from uh, from the other documents that we looked at. But you know, what you're seeing here, for example, is the the model is able to extract all of the different uh, fields that I was looking for. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I've got a party that that I I've labeled that that I'm looking for as party one. I've got the alias for party one. I've got party two that, that I was looking for as part of the document. I've also got the alias of party two, the agreement date, um, you know, and, and I, I can also extract clauses, right? So it's not just about extracting specific fields. I can go find the specific clause. So in this case, I'm looking for a force majeure clause. And, and I see that the force majeure clause is on page 19 of this document. So in each of the samples, force majeure clause may have been on different pages and different uh, sort of uh, sequences within each of those documents. And the model is able to identify what I'm specifically looking for and extract the right values depending on what the uh, what the specific uh, labels describe uh, without without relying primarily on the structure of the document. So and that's cool. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's basically now. Sorry to interrupt, but I just. An observation: I, the, As form recognizer has become more mature, the documents that it's able to process have become increasingly messier, which is really cool. That is correct, right? And and, and in addition to that, right? So if you think about like most organizations, ours is no exception. Unstructured documents is becoming the norm in terms of like how how organizations have to deal with this this variety of data problem, right? And with form recognizer and with the, with the new custom neural models. This is essentially the the future of like how we assume customers are going to want to to extract uh, all the different key points that they want to extract from each of these different document types that they have to deal with. This is amazing. Uh, so, anything else you want to show us, or where can people go to find out more? Um, yeah, so I'm glad you asked. There's actually a link at the bottom of the page that you can go look at. That uh, that 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 should be the the form recognizer documentation link that that shows you what's new in form recognizer today. Uh, in addition to that, I just wanted to call out that there's a number of other enhancements or improvements that uh, that if you're interested in, please go check it out. Uh, for example, I'll talk about um, things like uh, the pre-built models. We've got a number of new pre-built models as well in terms of uh, you know things that you can you can try out. Uh, the W two model is an example of uh, you know, for if you've got a tax or or, or a uh, sort of income verification scenario, the W two model is a great way for for you to automate some of those processing. Uh, we also have a new a model for health insurance cards. Uh, so each of these models is essentially intended to help you solve a specific business need uh, dealing with a specific document type. Uh, but there's also a wide variety of updates in terms of you know languages that we support. We're now up to 164 different languages with read and layout. Uh, where uh, you know, in terms of uh, languages that are supported within custom models, as well as languages that are uh, actually languages that are supported with pre-built models, uh, we've now extended to uh, sort of Latin-based languages like German, Dutch, uh, French, Italian, and uh, and Spanish. Uh, and we've also got a number of other improvements in terms of uh, both the SDKs, APIs, as well as latency improvements. So, so there's a there's a ton to unpack. There's lots more that, that I can share, but I know we're running out of time, so I'll stop there and, and, and turn back over to you. I mean, that's that's cool. Uh, make sure you go to the link. It should be just below. I, I don't know. It feels like uh, this is the kind of AI that actually helps businesses up level the kind of work we're doing instead of like taking a little form and then typing it into Excel, we can just have the computer do it for us so we can work on what's really important to our business, which is really cool. Thanks for being with us, my friend. Oh, thank you, Seth. It's, it's, been, it's been my pleasure. All right. So, my friends, you've been learning all about the latest from Azure Form Recognizer with my good friend, Vinod Kirpad. Thank you so much for watching, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Take care.
Wow, that was super cool. I'm gonna invite uh, the nod back on here. There we go. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Cassie, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good. Okay, form recognizer. I mean, I don't want to say it's my favorite cognitive service, but it is one of my favorites because it is so useful for so many different tasks. Um, and it just keeps improving. Like those updates are crazy good. Aren't they? I mean, that's that's one of the things that we're, we're super excited about. And, and we've got some really good feedback from a lot of our customers who, who tried out uh, the model, the preview. And, uh, you know, we're, we're excited to see what the rest of our customers are going to build based on form recognizer today. Yeah. And the thing is, too, is like with form recognizer, that affects every type of business. Like it's not just one business that needs uh, different processes happening with forms. It's all over the place. And the addition of unstructured data and structured data which we are the structured data you had previously, but there's a lot of new types of models as well. Um, so it's great to see it kind of evolve into uh, this even more useful. Um, so I'm waiting to see if there's any questions in the chat here. So if anybody has questions, now is your time to ask. We are live here with Vinod. If you don't have questions, I have questions. So I will, <laughs> I will take up this time myself. <laughs> Um, so one question I had is I noticed when you were making, um, like labeling the unstructured data and you could uh, kind of add that for your custom documents. Can I also do like custom models for my whole document? Like let's say I have different types of documents coming in like document indexing and I wanna know what types of documents they are and it's custom and specific to my business. Is that also a, something you can do with Form Recognizer? Yeah, so uh, essentially we have a capability today we call a composed model. And, it, and a composed model, if you think about it, is is a collection of models, right? So okay. what we do when uh, when you compose a model, let, let's just say you have three different types of documents. Let's say you have a, you know, maybe a request for information, you have an application form, and you have a, um, you just name it third, I, I, I don't know. Let's, let's just pick uh, maybe a, um, a, a bank statement. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And so now you want to build a custom model for each of these types to extract the values that you need. So you go off and you label a few documents of each of these types with the values that you want and you create a model for each of those. Now, what you can do is you can actually compose all of these three models together into a single model and you can call that a composed model. And so let's assume you have a website where a customer of yours uploads a document. Right. And you don't know what document they're uploading. They're just saying, here's the document you asked for. Right. And they upload a document. Now you can submit that document for analysis to this composed model. And the composed model actually runs a classification step prior to analysis. And it decides which of these three component models are the best, is the best suited to analyze this document that you just submitted. And then it routes that particular request to that doc to that model. And as a result, it gives you all the outputs from that model, but it also gives you another property, which is called the document type, which basically tells you which of those three component models that I choose to, to, to use in terms of analysis here. That's brilliant. So I train a custom model for each of my type of documents, and then I can create, what was it called, a composite? A composed model, yeah. Composed. So you're just composing these, these models together into a single model. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think multi-model solutions are kind of where a lot of things are going because there's so many tasks you need, and sometimes it's easier to Let's focus on one and then put them together in a pipeline that understands what it is and then you know extracts those key value pairs of the information that you need out of that document and can automate some things that are very manual, I bet, in a lot of companies right now. Yeah, yeah. So so you know, I, we see a lot of like document automation workflows, obviously, is 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 key to to what customers are using it as for. But then mm -hmm. there's also scenarios around like say knowledge mining where where you've got all these different uh, types of documents you're trying to use some of those uh, insights that that form recognizer can generate to, to sort of like stratify some of this data and then finally you've got like you know things like uh, maybe some sort of like fraud analytics or something like that right where you're you're taking a historical view of this data running through form recognizer and then trying to determine if you can see patterns in the data that that uh that might help you with with fraud detection as an example so there's there's a wide variety of ways that customers are using using form recognizer today uh but again it's a it's it like you mentioned right at the at the beginning it's a problem that every one of uh, every organization has today, like in terms of like dealing with with documents as well mm -hmm. as dealing with forms and, and sort of automating processes. Like I think the second machine learning model I built was document classification. So I've actually went through the manual process of doing what form recognizer does, but like way not as cool and way not as useful. And so just like the amount of time you save by just using some of these pre-built models, it's like why would you? There's no reason to really build your own anymore in some of these situations. 
Um, particularly because you can also integrate with things like Power Platform. So one of the things I did is I actually rebuilt that, but then I used Power Platform and I used uh, um, a workflow that actually called into Form Recognizer and then did my classification and then went back to Power Platform and put it in a database. And so now you're talking somebody with no coding skills or machine learning skills can actually leverage this and start automating um, different pieces. So we do have yeah, a question. Yeah, exactly, right? And, and I think the... the Go ahead. Oh sorry. yeah, go ahead. Okay, no, so we I, have I was going to say, like, let's let's go to the question. Okay, so could form recognizer differentiate between location information in a document? Um, and then they said, say between a customer location and an employer location, where we just want to gather to customer location, and this could be anywhere in the document. Uh, that's a great question. So, so, so if you think about it, it, it all comes down to how you're labeling your document, right? So let's just say you have. Uh, two locations in a document. One one says, you know, this is uh, this is my customer location, and the, the other one is describing your your say um, your store location, right? Um, so if you if you label your document and you say like I'm looking for a field that's that store location, then it should be able to identify and disambiguate between those two locations to say which of these two locations corresponds to the store location, and then if you have a second field that you could label as customer location, uh, that would or, or or something that that it that sort of uh, help the model disambiguate between the two sort of locations that you're looking for. The model should pick the right location for each of those particular keys that you're defining. Because it's so configurable and customizable at this point, where it's like you can really customize to whatever your solution is. So um, yeah, exactly right. I mean, so so the, the the key with form recognizer though is to think about it as a sort of uh, I like to use the layer cake analogy, right? So so uh, you know at the, at the very bottom you have OCR, then you have uh, sort of the the capabilities that you get from the uh, document agnostic models. Uh, things like layout and, and general document. So we typically run layout as part of most uh, most sort of uh, models that, that you get. Um, and then finally, you have the document type specific models, right? And, and so these are the pre-built models that, that, that we know work with a specific type of document. For example, a W2 model knows that it needs to work with a W2 type of document. Uh, and then if you have uh, a custom document type that you want to work with, you go train a custom model for that, right? So so just, just sort of like pick the right, uh, like, like tool for the purpose, I guess, and, and try to figure out like, you know, does does layout get you what you want or does a combination of layout and a pre-built get you what you want or does a combination of layout and, and, and custom get you what you want? So you have to really like think through the the use case and how you're planning to use form recognizer here. Cool, yeah, it's always the right tool for the, the right job. Any other questions people have? Let me see if I wrote down anything else that, um... oh, Ignite, I was gonna ask you about Ignite. Is there any, um sessions or things they should look for um, around form, form Recognizer at Ignite coming up? Oh, we, we only just released our latest GA update like uh, okay. right uh, this this month. So, so we're we're sort of on a, a little bit of a, um, we're, we're, we're looking for feedback. We're trying to hear what, what customers are, are saying. You know, we, we've, we've done a ton of improvements based on feedback within the preview period. Uh, we're also continuing to work on on sort of our next iteration of, of what we want to build and how we want to extend these things. So at this time at Ignite, we really don't have a, a ton of like major announcements. Or we think okay. we're going to probably be uh, more along the the build timeframe for, for for major announcements at least. Uh, but we we plan to have some uh, you know some of us are going to be at Ignite. I'm not necessarily sure who exactly from our team is going to be there. Okay. Uh, so please, if you have any any questions or want to talk to us, like like let us know. That's awesome. Um, another uh, question I had was about data sources. Um, so you, you showed in the studio, which is really cool. I can go and I can try and see, OK, what kind of model, uh, model do I need to use for my solution? And how is this going to react to different documents? Now, when I actually go to use that model, and so I'm obviously going to be using like the API and the SDK and stuff that you were showing um, that I can then use and, and integrate into my applications. So my question is, does that what what data sources um, can I connect in? Is it is it just what I do that all on the code side once I implement with the API, or is there some sort of um, tool that you would use um, within it? Yeah, we don't we don't necessarily provide a interface into a specific data source. Uh, okay. So we have three mechanisms that you can submit a document to us in, right? Uh, obviously API based, but uh, the three mechanisms are you could just point us to a particular file within a URL, and you can just say, here's the URL to the file that I want to, to submit. 
-hmm. you could send us the file as a uh, as a base 64 encoded payload and you could say like you know here's the payload that contains the file or you could just stream the file to us right so all of those are mechanisms in which you can invoke the api to to address a particular location but we don't necessarily provide a uh, a data source uh, per se, that says you know we understand a specific data source like say storage or SQL or something like that. We, we don't we don't typically tie ourselves to any any implementation as such. Great, so it's super flexible and you can implement it with whatever data source um, you're using. You just have to yeah, exactly um, right. So so if you're for example on storage and and you you can you upload a blob. Uh, you know, you can always configure a blob trigger to say like, oh, whenever a new blob is added to a storage account uh, within this particular container, you know, invoke this form recognizer request to 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 send this document off to form recognizer, have have it processed, take the output, drop it somewhere else, and you got a sort of a process that you can you can automate. All right, we have another question: um, Is there a document type limit per model, or what would be a best practice for a limit? Um, I'm going to make an assumption here in terms of what the question is because I'm I'm not exactly clear on what when when the when the uh, when it's, when we are asking about a document type limit. Um, I think there's I, I'll I'll use uh, the vocabulary that oh. we typically use. I yeah. think I know what it means. I think he means like when I was asking about different like classifying different types of documents yeah. and then making the model that comes together. Yeah. I think he's asking like is there is there a limit of how many class is how many models I can put in my model that decides what there is indeed, yes, model. yes, yes okay. there is a limit and that limit is 200 today right so so you can okay. uh you can compose up to 200 models into a single model that's a lot that's a lot right so so yeah, yeah. uh and, and and in in terms of uh you know like why you might want to do more than that I think you know just want to make sure like like this is this comes up a lot in a lot of the customer conversations I have is uh, with a custom template model, for example, uh, you need to create a single model per template variation, right? So, for example, you get a bank statement. You get a bank statement from, like, say, bank one and bank two, and they're they're slightly different in terms of, like, you know, what things are called, where they're where they're positioned, and so forth. Like, the header is not in the same place. The 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 line items are not in the same place. You're going to have to create a model for each of these templates, uh, and then compose them together to say, this is my composed bank statement model. Uh, but with the with the new custom neural models, you don't need to do that. All you need to do is just label a few examples of each of the different variations that you're dealing with, create a single training data set and train a single model, and and that should solve your problem. So the 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 sort of guiding uh, sort of principle is when you're dealing with custom neural models, try to uh, as long as all the fields that you're trying to extract are the same from from the from a single document type. Treat all the different variations as just a single training data set and train a single model. And that should eliminate the need for you to have as many composed models in the future. So I suppose can you you can't have like another layer of I have a classification of a classification and then go in? Like is there you, you can't, right? So there's nothing to stop you from from composing okay. multiple models together. And each of those could be a composed model in, in itself. But we still enforce a 200 limit on all of the composed models. So, so like for okay. example, you got like five models that you compose into compose one, and and another 25 models in, in compose two, and you compose those two together. We're still going to ensure that the eventual composed model that you build only has 200 component models within it. But you can have multiple nesting layers of models for making Absolutely. decisions. Absolutely. Absolutely, you can do that. Wow, that's super powerful. Yes, that, that and, and again, like I said, right. It, it is super useful in scenarios where customers don't know what, what their uh, end users are going to be sending them. And they just say, hey, I know it's a document that I need to process. I just don't know which one it is. This is a great way to handle those sorts of problems. Wow. Well, now is your time to ask any more questions. I don't think I had any more questions um, for you. But I love to see the progress that's happening there. Um, and just see like how powerful and it's becoming and even more so in, in ways that are going to really help people modernize their like their um, like robotic process automation and things like that without having to spend all of the money on building uh, complex models in-house because that's expensive and time consuming and we've done yeah. all the hard work for you. A lot of resources to keep those current too, right? So so you're, you're going uh, you yeah. to, the, the effort is not just in, in building the model the first time, but the effort is also in maintaining it and, and keeping it keeping it current. So that is, there's a significant amount of challenge there. All right. Well, thank you so much. Anything else you want to share? 
And no, it's been my pleasure, Karen. Thank you, Cassie. It's been it's been fun. Thank you. Thanks so much. See you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. All right, but everybody else, keep hanging out because we're on to our um, next video, and this is going to be about the Azure uh, PyTorch containers, and um, we're going to see some neat things that are happening there. So let's jump in. Hey everyone. hey, everyone. I'm Cassie, Cassie Brevue, Brevue, filling in for Seth today on the AI Show, and you are not going to want to miss this episode. We are going to be talking about Azure containers uh, for training with PyTorch and Azure DSVM. Let's take a look. So joining me today is Parnita. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, Cassie. Nice to be here. Um, I'm Parnita Rahi. I am a PM in the Azure Platform team. Um, so glad to be here to talk about the new container for uh, PyTorch that's now available for, uh, on Azure. Cool. Can you tell me a little bit about what this um, container is? Sure. So, um, you know, data scientists, ML engineers, et cetera, um, generally when they have um, a, a training workflow, um, of, you know, for, for large models, uh, one of the challenges that they face is, you know, what are the different uh, dependencies, binaries, et cetera, et cetera, I need to get installed uh, to have a, a, a ease of setup. This mm -hmm. container helps um, developers, scientists kind of set up, uh, develop, and accelerate, um, you know, training workloads um, meant for, uh, you know, large, large workloads like GPUs uh, for their PyTorch models. It's now available on Azure uh, as, um, as a container, as a curated environment, as well as a DSVM. Um, so it's, it's available for like ease of download and you, know, you, can, you can get started very easily for any of your training uh, work needs. That's really cool. So basically I'm able to create a DSVM or data science um, virtual machine um, or use the container. Um, and now is the container in part of Azure Machine Learning? Um, can I use it there as well, right? Yeah, it's 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 something that you can go to the Azure ML Studio and you know in the curated environment section, uh, you can easily go and and look it up and and get started. So it's it's a pretty pretty simple workflow that you can now use with uh, um, Azure ML. Cool. So you mentioned some of the people that are using this are engineers. So it's like the ML engineers, data scientists. Like who are the main kind of um, roles that are going to be leveraging uh, this container? Um, as as I mentioned earlier um, it's primarily for data scientists it's also for like large enterprises who have training workflows on pytorch um, imagine somebody who has like an nlp um, uh, modeling workflow uh, for uh, uh, you know language models or text and speech models who generally use pytorch and um, have dependencies uh, to kind of get that set up uh, those are the ideal candidates uh, who will benefit from this uh, this container. What are some of the benefits of using this pre-configured container versus you know something that they would set up themselves? Well, you know, when you get started, um, uh, especially with the different versions you have uh, of, let's say, PyTorch or uh, you know Python or mm -hmm. or CUDA um, and other like essentials that that needs to you know. For you to like set up your training workflow, figuring out which version is compatible with what, what are the dependencies, all of that can take uh, you know a lot of like back and forth in figuring out like bugs, etc. This container, what it does is it has your essentials required for training. So it has uh, you know the, the the version of Ubuntu set up with like CUDA or Rockm, depending on which uh, driver you use, uh, with the with Python versions and the latest PyTorch versions pre-validated and pre-installed. Um, and it's again tested and uh, with uh, a, a, a suite of um, Microsoft internal 1P workloads. So it has been pre-verified. So it, it basically takes away a lot of the pain uh, that scientists, engineers, et cetera, have to go through while, while starting off with their new training um, scenario. So you just kind of go get it from Azure ML and get started. That's that's pretty much all you need. And uh, in addition, what it also provides is a bunch of these training optimization uh, libraries. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, ORT, 
uh, which mm-hmm. is you know uh, used for accelerating training of like large transformer uh, models in PyTorch. Um, so you can leverage ORT because it's kind of pre-packaged within this container. You can also leverage uh, Deep Speed, which is uh, a deep learning optimization library, um, which makes like training easy and effective. Um, there is also like Msicle, which is a collective communication library that Microsoft Open Source provides. That's bundled within this container, um, and and these are just a few that I'm naming. That there is a whole lot that you can that, that you can use. So it's it's kind of um, packaged with us looking at these um, 1P training scenarios and what does it take for a normal workload to be effective, uh, to like mm-hmm. uh, to get started easily, to to have uh, optimization, especially since you're running these on GPUs, you would look at training optimization. So um, you know all of that is kind of bundled in um, for for ease of uh, setup and and. Uh, you know, uh, acceleration. Awesome. So I'm going to be able to now train my models faster and set up my training faster, and then maybe we'll lev- leverage this on Azure resources. Um, and then there's that cost savings that comes along with well because it takes or it comes along with it as well because it takes time to set up these containers, right? So there's less less time for that. But then also, uh, you're going to train your models faster, so you're going to save money on your cloud computing bill as well, right? That's true. Like, like in in a lot of like hugging. I mean, as I mentioned, these are optimized, uh, faster training. So your your uh, time to compute or time to train uh, goes down significantly. We have seen like uh, forty five to eighty five percent improvements if, wow. with some of our hugging face models. Um, and since I mean, like you said, it, it's also help helping. It helps you like you know reduce your um, compute costs as well. So it has all of these um, pre-built packages configured together, ready to use. Um, can I customize it to add some additional packages that might be specific to my model training? Yeah, so I think um, uh, Jessica will, will give a deep dive uh, in a later session, but uh, there are two ways in which you can use um, these curated environments. You can use them as is, like if you just want to start with something and you don't have other dependencies that you need, which is uh, like already not captured within the workflow, then you can just get started with the curated environment uh, from the Azure uh, ML Studio. However, you can also use this as a base to get started with any additional dependencies you may have. So you can get this environment downloaded it and then then install um, any additional dependencies. It's it definitely minimizes your steps. Um, uh, however, yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to share about this container? Generally, like if you have you know. Um, Fast, like if you're looking for faster training, if you have workloads, uh, you know, with uh, with the larger models, um, you want to get started uh, without having to spend a lot of time uh, for setting up, because this is an as-is pre-installed uh, package, and, and it can also help you scale because you know you can share within the enterprise, uh, you can easily share it with a lot of your engineers to get started without uh, them having to like worry about these dependencies. And then if you have a workflow on Azure, I think it, these are definitely like some of the criterias wherein you need to like consider um, this container. In addition, what it also provides is because this is on the latest um, PyTorch version, our teams will continue to provide support uh, and expert troubleshooting and guidance for the latest PyTorch build. So if you're thinking about you know, having a uh, any questions uh, addressed as as you start off your uh, training journey, uh, or you know uh, Azure support, all the goodness that comes with it, um, it is provided through this uh, container. Um, the other thing is, uh, as I already mentioned, like you know all of these um, ML packages uh, that are open source are are tested and against a suite of uh, ML workflows within Microsoft. You are you're basically like leveraging all of the goodness uh, and saving time and saving costs. So. All good things here. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today, Pranita. Next up, we're going to talk to Jessica. And Jessica is going to show us some demos of this container in action. All right. Now we are joined by Jessica. And she is going to tell us a little bit about how Azure Container for PyTorch works. Jessica, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, and thanks for having me. My name is Jessica Chaffee. I am a product owner on the Azure AI platform working with the training group. And for this effort, I've been really focusing on connecting the Azure Container for PyTorch and our curated environments that we currently offer on Azure AI. 
Awesome. Well, I'm certainly excited uh, to see this in action since we've been talking about it. So let's get your screen shared. Awesome. So why don't you show us how it works? Sure. So when you enter your workspace in the Azure Machine Learning Studio, you can go down to this environments option in the menu on the left side and clicking that will bring you to a view of the different environments that we have. So at the top here, we have both curated environments and custom environments. Curated environments are environments that we have put together. Um, they contain a lot of dependencies and accesses that you guys would want to have when you're running your deep learning uh, training. And we kind of put that all together for you so you don't have to worry about going and trying to find, oh, does this version match with this version mm -hmm. of the software that I run, wanna run? We have all that for you and uh, you are able to use that pretty easily. So initially when you do come to this view, there is a very long list of all the different options that we have here. We have different versions of different OSs that are there. We have uh, uh, different CUDA versions that you could use as well. So searching for Azure Container for PyTorch or if you do ACPT for short, you will see our two newest options here. The first one here is for CUDA version um, 11.3. And the second one would be for CUDA version 11.5. So currently we have those two offerings out for the ACPT curated environments. Awesome, so these were just added. Um, and so they're brand new for people to try out. And then there was also, like you showed, there's a lot of other environments there that I can use. So I can use these within Azure Machine Learning. Um, can you show us a little bit about how I might use these? Yeah, absolutely. So when you want to run a job you can opt to choose a environment to run that job with so if we go here to this jobs option it will bring up a menu where you can run jobs if you click new here and then go to jobs down at the bottom you'll be brought up with a create a training job menu where you can go through and select your options so i will click to do a compute cluster and click my cluster that i have here then moving over for the environment type as the second option, you can choose between curated environments and the options will populate below like we just discussed, or you can choose a custom environment, which would be something that you'd customize to your specific needs. So for this one, we'll go with our curated environment. And if you expand the option here, you can see all the different information. So since this is our CUDA 11.3 GPU version, you can see that it's version one because it is brand new. Um, so I will select this one as our environment clicking next you'll be able to configure your job settings um, so you can change the name of your job your experiment name and then upload your code accordingly so i will upload a folder that i have here um, and then i will click the folder upload my code click upload again and it will upload the code that i have in that folder and then to start the job you have to enter the command so i will just type in Python train.py to make sure that file runs. There are additional options at the bottom for any inputs and outputs you want to add, training applications, environment variables, all these things that you can do to customize your job. I'll click PyTorch here and then click next. And then this last page here in the menu is just where you can review the job specification to make sure that you set everything the way you want. Your compute is set up and what you were expecting, the different settings that you set. So the name, the experiment, things like that, the command that you want to run to run the training. And the environment you can see here is our new Azure container for PyTorch, the CUDA 11.3 version. So going with that, I will click create. And just like that, your job will be started. Cool. So is there any kind of updates that I need to make to my script that I that I upload there? Or can I take the just the, the script that I was using, you know, maybe locally for testing and, and put it up on this container? You should be able to. The only thing that would be important to note is that there, if there are specific libraries that you want to make sure that uh, align with the code that you're running, you could actually use this image that we have as a base image and customize it to make sure that the libraries are included to, for your specific project. Cool, so I can take this and use it as like a base environment and then um, install the additional libraries that I need to customize this curated environment? Yes, exactly. 
cool. Are we going to see that? Are you going to show us how to do that? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. So I will bring us back to the environments menu. And like I mentioned earlier, we have the curated environments option at the top, which all of which are all of our preset options. And then I can open up one here and kind of just show a little bit more of the details in the Docker file here. So you can see the properties kind of lined out for you here on the left. And on the right, you can see the base image at the top and then some of the dependencies that we include. So if these are all that you need to run for your project and nothing is missing, you can use it just as is. But if you would like to customize it for yourself, all you would need to do is copy this here, and then you would be able to go to custom environments and click create. So for here, pick a name. I'll just name it my environment. You can add a description if you'd like, or from the select environment type, you can either start from an existing environment if there is something that you already have running in our system, or you can create a new Docker context and use the image. So from the customize menu, there are, you can see some pre-populated information here. So all you would need to do is remove the image that we have here and replace it with the ACPT image. So as you can see, it's the CUDA 11.5 version, um, PyTorch. And then underneath here, you see we have run pip install Azure ML dash ML flow. You can change this ML flow to be whatever you need. If you need transformers, you can pip install transformers. And here you can adjust all the dependencies that you have on top of the base image that we're already providing. So you're able to customize this however you need to best fit your training experiments and experience. That's awesome. So you can leverage all this work that's been done to create this container um, that's pre-ready, but then when you just need to add like that little tweak to what you need, it's really easy. You just create a custom environment, import that um, container, and then add your pip installs. Yep, and you use it the same exact way when you're setting up a job. So instead of just selecting curate environment, you switch to the custom environment and pick the one that you named. It's that simple. Super cool. So what are some of the reasons I might use the curated environment or instead of an environment that I was using previously or the new, so, the new environment? Yeah, so this new environment comes with a lot of performance speed ups. So by utilizing the best of Microsoft technology for uh, deep learning and uh, distributed training, um, such as DSpeed, Onyx Runtime, um, the combination of those options and enabling those when you're using your environment, you can actually see performance speeds from 48 to even double sometimes from your previous runs. So I actually do have an example of uh, an, an example of this performance increase on some previous runs. So cool, here is, it. yeah, a GPT run of a uh, NLP training operation. You could see it was completed in four hours and 37 minutes using the baseline. If we look at the deep speed by using our curated environment, you can see that the total runtime decreased to an hour and 42 minutes. Yeah. That so is amazing. It went from over four hours to a little over an hour and a half. That's about a 2.7 times speed increase for the same training job utilizing our new environment. That's awesome. So that's time saving, like if you need to retrain things and money saving on um, the compute resources. Oh, absolutely. Um, which compute was used for um, this training? You know what? Let's let's double check. So I should be able to go to compute, go to the clusters, and we can see this is an NT24 SV3. And I should be able to click here and see some additional information. Yes. Yeah, so this is a NVIDIA V100. Well, that was some impressive performance improvements just by updating to the new uh, curated environment. Is there anything else you want to tell us about the uh, new environment? Yeah, so the environment is currently in public preview. You can learn more at our Microsoft Azure Machine Learning documentation. Um, so we'll share that link below here. Go ahead and check out those documentations to learn more. And Ignite is coming up as well. Is there anything um, exciting happening? Um, with these environments at Ignite? Yes, so we'll actually talking a little bit more about some of the updates and the improvements that the environments have seen at Ignite during our uh, deployment. So definitely check out Ignite to learn some more. Great. 
Well, I will be setting my calendar to be at Ignite. Well, I'm speaking at Ignite, so I will also know that it's happening. But everyone else <laughs> should set their calendar um, and go check out this session uh, so they can learn more about these curated environments. Thanks so much uh, for hanging out with us today, Jessica. Thanks so much for having me. All right. So let's now get Jessica and Pernita on stream with us. There you are. Hey. Hello. Hi, Cassie. So that was a lot of information um, that we just went over, but and, and super powerful as well. You know, I got a lot of my questions answered since I was able to, to interview for that video. And just seeing how um, much time it, like if you haven't tried to configure all of these libraries together or optimize with different tools and spent all the time trying to figure out you know, what parameters are best and all of, all of that, um, it takes a long time to do. Yeah, I think, and yeah, that's, that's like yeah, you hit the, the nail on the head. I think it's, it's meant for that, like take away all of the headache that scientists and engineers have to go through while setting up their training. Yeah, I mean, as you could, as, as Jessica showed, it's, it's, it's very simple. It's, it's pretty much click of buttons to get you started. Um, so. Yeah. And so like the way that form recognizer was, you know, automating the, you know, the, using models from like a UI perspective and not having to customize it. Now we're going into that next level and we're looking at now, how can I optimize training and be more efficient and better at that when I am going to have to create those custom in-house models? So what are some of the, um, like you said, or what's some of the availability for like the SDK and the, the CLI um, with this? Like the, it's because it's with Azure Machine Learning, right? That's the SDK that you would use? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so is there any updates with that, that um, with these new environments or containers, or does is that already a, like a pre-existing feature within the CLI and SDK? Parni, do you want to touch on this, or would you um, like me to? So um, I think you could you could take it, but generally within the Azure Rebel, uh, you know, you have the version of the studio, which is the UI uh, version, and then it's also available as CLI. Um, um, so you could uh, you know you can run through um, through that or through the Python SDK. So all of this is uh, available within the Azure Rebel workflows, like different ways in which you can leverage uh, the container. So that means that like I can be in my Jupyter notebook and I can be using, um, you know, creating environments from there too, or I can be doing using the UI in Azure Machine Learning. Um, and so there's multiple ways that I can actually leverage this and work it into my kind of like development flow, right? Yes. Cool. Now, does anybody else have questions out there for them? They are here live to answer your questions about this container. Um, I would love to hear what other people have. I'm not seeing anything yet. Oh, um, okay, I have another one then. Uh, so what type of models and, and training um, does this work with? So we have so like internally, I yeah, we've internally tried it uh, on, um, on various um, NLP models, uh, basically speech and, um, and text transformer models. Uh, as well as a few vision models, and we've seen gains, uh, you know, uh, like up from 20 to 30 to 40 percent, depending on uh, different workloads and what setups they used. Um, so it's it's pretty much you know meant for larger workloads, uh, ideal for like uh, like you know meant for transformer models, um, and um, if you have GPU uh, needs for your like for training, um, it's meant for for those model types. But it's been tested for over like. 30 to 40 models internally and shown gains across all of those. So, uh, and as I had mentioned, oh. like even with hugging face models, we've tried it um, with ORT and ORT plus deep speed composed together. And we've seen, um, you know, for eight up to 85% gains uh, with the various settings that, uh, that folks use. Uh, the other thing is um, it, this is kind of flexible, right? It works with NVIDIA or AMD GPUs. So it, it doesn't matter what, what your underlying um, stack is. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, also, uh, you know, it's composable, like you can use all of these different acceleration capabilities together, like you can combine ORT training with deep speed and, and C gain. So that's another thing that uh, this container kind of provides you with. 
Well, I didn't know that it uh, supported multiple hardware, but that makes sense and that's awesome. And then also when it comes to large models, um, that's where you really need that because those are so expensive to train. So to be able to speed up large models, I feel like that's where you'll see the biggest need for this type of container in the first place. Not, not to say it won't work on other ones, but I feel like the need to optimize the large models is uh, one of those pain points that a lot of people are feeling when they try to take a GPT-2 or a BERT and, and then start to fine tune it for their specific task. Um, so we have a question, I'll show up here. Um, can I use ACPT on AML compute instances? Jessica, do you wanna take that? Um, so thinking right now, I mean, talking about ACBT and the container, the curated environments. Um, I'm not fully sure. Parnita, do you want to add anything for that if it can be used on compute instance? Uh, I need to check that. I, I Yeah, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head right now. I'm, I'm pretty sure. No. So like we were using a compute cluster and I think what they're yes. asking is like, you know, in AML, you have your compute and you can create different types of compute. Um, and the compute clusters are what you use in, in Azure Machine Learning in order to train your models. So um, you could definitely use this on a training cluster. Now, if they're asking mm -hmm. about the instance where you spin up an instance and you have like a notebook and different things working there, um, can we use the Azure curated environments within like a compute? So I think a compute instant versus a compute cluster is like what that means, right? That question. Um, has that been tested at all? Like if, if I was experimenting? Um... Um, how about I get back on that? And I don't want to misquote and give a, give a wrong answer. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we can probably answer on, on, the, on the YouTube channel. We will get back to you. Great question. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it looks like this is a form recognizer question. So I will save that for once um, we are done. Vinod is not, is not still online with us, but... Um, we'll come back to that one. Any more questions around the ACPT or Azure um, Container? Not Azure Container Instances, it's uh, Azure Curated Environments. That's what it is with the... Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, both of you for um, hanging out with us and showing us this neat feature. Um, I'm excited to get feedback from people trying it out. Um, I hope that they, you know, tweet at us or, or let us know, reach out if you um, use these container instances and let us know how, how they work for you. So thanks so much. Thank you. Now, Thank everybody you. else, you can hang out with us. You can stay on with us. You're not rid of me this quick. Okay, so let me look at this form recognizer question. So when will we prefer form recognizer versus cognitive services, e.g. if I need to text extract, say, a PDF, which has graphics, tables with subgroups and structured data, which option should we choose? So I think what you're asking is there's like all these different services within cognitive services and you have uh, form recognizer is actually one of the cognitive services suite, but we also have a lot of other ones. And at what point um, do I use which cognitive service? And you can actually use multiple uh, together depending on what you're trying to do. So if the if you need to first do like maybe form recognizer and extract data and key value pairs and then maybe you put that into a database um, and then you do in a second one that has you know image recognition i think that would have to be a separate um, service that we provide in cognitive service so i think if you have multiple tasks that you need um, to complete on a particular document or image um, then you would need to use multiple services now i know form recognizer works on images of documents as well so I'm not sure if when you see so you, when you're saying graphics, not just images, let me show this down here too. Does it get the full text in there? Awesome. Um, yeah, so I form recognizer works with tables as well, structured. So I think form recognizer would do most of this. And when you, if you say, when you say graphics, are you saying graphics within a document or a document as an image? That's what I'm not quite sure on, on that question. Um, but yeah, just like you could use multiple models within Form Recognizer, you might have um, a, a second model that runs on a document that does a different task. Because when you think about machine learning, think of it, each model is kind of solving a specific task for you. And then you chain those together to get your, your automation.
All right, really great questions. Um, now we are going to, wait, where is it? This one, get to work. All right, so let me get my screen ready here to share. We are going to, so now that we've gone through all of the um, exciting things that are happening within uh, AI, not, well, not all of the things, there's so much going on, but you know what I mean. Um, let me share my screen here. Great, okay. So the second part here, Oh, let me go back to the question here. Um, so for, let me show this again. Perform recognizer suits my situation since it fits the, I think, need if it can make sense of images in a document. Okay, so if it can, if form recognizer can make sense of images in a document, then that would work. And I, I think it can. Um, but I am. I, I wish Nod was still here because uh, we could have asked him that. Also, um, we got we got an answer on the compute instances uh, question. Is that currently um, you would not be able to use it with a compute instance? It's just compute clusters for kicking off training jobs, but it's something that's being worked on. So, uh, really great question. And I see Pernita actually added that in the chat as well. So not yet, but it's being worked on. Um, and it's great to see that there, there's an interest in that as well that helps us um, understand what people want and need to use. So, so thanks so much. OK, let's go back to what we're going to be talking about today. So recently, we um, the Onyx Runtime team released uh, this really interesting blog um, with NVIDIA, and it was about model optimization. So we're kind of sticking with this theme of optimization today. And this one was showing how to add um, Onyx Runtime Olive, and if you don't know what that is, that's what we're gonna be playing with today, along with the Triton uh, model uh, inference server. Let's see, do I have my zoom in? Oops, I don't have my zoom on. Let me zoom this a little bit. There we go, hopefully you can see that a little bit better and then use the Triton inference server to do inferencing. Um, and there's all these different layers of optimization and complexity that you'd normally have to do and figure out, but with these tools together, you were able to do that. So like when we were talking about um, the Azure container for PyTorch, like it's doing a lot of this for you. So if you're training there, but if you want to do it yourself, um, or maybe you're experimenting locally and um, trying to figure out how to get your model to work best, there are these tools. So um, if you go to the repo here, let me scroll this in again. There we go. And I will share this um, GitHub as well. Um, so there you go. There is the link. And this uh, repo, oh, we got another question. Um, so this is still back, I think, on the form recognizer, and they're asking, how can I scan, recognize multiple PDF page text? Um, yeah, so when you, if your document has multiple pages, that's not a problem. Uh, form recognizer can handle that when you when you send it off to them. Um, it'll it'll page through. I don't think it has to be a single a single page, from my understanding. It's another good question. Okay, so all, um, Olive, which stands for Onyx Go Live, is a Python package that is going to automate accelerating models. Okay, and so we're going to look at how it does that, and we're going to look at the different features and things that it used, and then we're actually going to try it out too. And just you know, I haven't really tried this out yet. Um, it was something that I knew of and I had been wanting to try out, so we're going to do it together. So <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Things might break, you know naturally. Um, but let's go through and see what this is all about. Um, so it can first convert your model for you. So if you've ever, um, you know, if you train a model with Python or with Python, with PyTorch or TensorFlow, well, yeah, it's usually with Python as well, but you're going to be using something like PyTorch or TensorFlow. 
Um, so you train your model and then um, you need to convert it to an Onyx format in order to leverage the optimization and performance improvements that Onyx Runtime provides and this Olive package. So there's different ways to convert it and um, different kind of uh, parameters that you can set. And so what Olive does is it actually does it for you. Um, so that's one step. So when you um, need to then convert your model, that is part of this package. And then uh, the next is now that I have converted it to Onyx, um, I can do auto performance tuning with Onyx Runtime. Um, and so there's different optimizations and things that you can apply to your model um, in order to make it faster, like quantization, um, threading, uh, parallelism, you know, all these different things that you have to start thinking about, which is, um, you know, what hardware at, what execution providers are you going to be using? Um, and so these different optimization fields and, and things that you would need to manually configure get automated within this. So let's kind of look at what some of these optimization, uh, optimization, <laughs> optimization fields are and kind of what they mean. So the first one is execution providers. And I love when they link to things in the document. So thank you, whoever set up this GitHub, where um, the execution providers is based on what hardware you're using, right? So if you're using a NVIDIA GPU, you're probably using you know, CUDA, TensorRT. Um, if you're using AMD or Intel, you know, so you have all these different execution providers based on you know, if you're using CPU, GPU, um, ARM, IoT, you know, all of these different things that have to be considered um, and have to be optimized in different ways in order to have your model run efficiently on different hardware. So that's one consideration that you need to make when um, trying to optimize. Um, you have your environment variables and then your session options. So session options is part of um, the Onyx runtime when you uh, are, you can use it as defaults. So you don't actually have to set these. Um, and if you're not trying to you know, tune performance, you don't necessarily have to. You can take the default session options, but if you wanna configure them to try to get better optimization, um, you set different ones. You can change them based on the needs of your model and, and the performance um, that you're looking for. Uh, so some of these different ones are, let me scroll in a little bit more here because I feel like that's still a little small. Um, and I can put this link in the docs as well or in the uh, chat, I mean, the docs link in the chat. Um, so thread count. Um, so this controls the number of threads used to run the model. Uh, sequential or parallel execution. So um, this is, again, one that you can override and set. So controls whether the operator and the graph run sequentially or in parallel. Um, this is something that's going to be auto-tuned for you as well within Olive. Um, let's see what else we have graph optimization level. Um, so there's different optimizations that they, you can um, add. Um, and I'm gonna send this to you as well. And the different levels. So whenever I use this, I've always just set all, I've never really dived super deep into the different ones that are needed. And with Olive, I can, it'll figure it out for me by auto tuning these different things. So what it does is it takes all of this, all of these different optimization parameters um, and it does uh, search, let, let's see, where is it? It outputs the option combination. This is the important part. It outputs the option combination with the best performance for latency or for throughput. So all of these different things that you could sit and tweak and tune um, for your model while you're trying to hit you know, a certain threshold um, is going to be automated for you. So you can dive into these as much as you want, or you can use this tool that's going to do it for you, which we're going to play with. Um, and then quantization. Um, so this is going to do int 8 quantization. And there's different quantization tools within Onyx Runtime. Um, but essentially what it does, it's going to drastically reduce the size of your model. Um, you sometimes you you will lose a little bit of accuracy, but it's going to allow you to get a much smaller, uh, faster model with minimal accuracy loss is kind of the, the full the goal of, of quantization. And um, to put very simply, it's reducing the size of the numbers. Now, it is much more complex than that. And I'm going to send this to you. And if you want to read about it, you can. But that is another um, type of performance optimization that you might be doing um, to get your model to work the way you need, which is part of this. Um, 
Now it also has um, transformer model optimization. So what this one does is um, Onyx Runtime has, you know, optimizations that are going to work for transformer models, but they have an additional uh, package that is specific for optimizations for transformer packages or transformer models. And so um, this one talks about what you'd have to do in order to use these uh, different additional configurations um, and optimizations uh, with the Onyx Runtime Transformer optimizers. Um, and you can see how you would do that. Uh, but this is all built in to all it, which I just like that name, like, but it makes me hungry because I don't know, I'm personally a big fan of olives. I don't know if you all are, but, but yeah, anyways, food names. Um, but it makes sense when you think about what it is and why they call it that. So we are going to play around with this now, now that we kind of understand what it is. Is there any questions on that? Like any questions about what it is exactly? Like, hopefully that was enough high level information to kind of understand all the different pieces that are coming together within it and why you would use it. So you can go from like, I've trained my model and then you can convert and optimize um, in a much more simplistic workflow is kind of the idea. No questions? Okay, let's, let's play with this then. And um, let me close out some of these. Otherwise, I'll get lost in tabs. I know some people, they'll just have so many tabs open, and I don't know how they find anything when it's like that. I can't. I have to close things. I guess it kind of helps if you do the, like, vertical tabs. I thought that's what this does. Yeah. So you can go, like, vertical, but no. I'm keeping it old school, horizontal, just closing things. Um, okay. Okay. Oh, and this code here, I'm going to send this to you as well. This is another good resource if you want to play with this. This is from the blog post that was just posted. Um, and this is uh, the source uh, to go through and recreate that and then add in. Um, so we're just going to talk about Olive, but this also has the train inference uh, server and the model analyzer to add additional um, optimizations. And then the train inference server is like a, a pre-configured um, inference server with different optimization libraries. Okay. So let's go back here. So there's some different tutorials here. I'm just going to go with the Jupyter Notebook one. And we're going to just kind of run through these. And um, these ones, I think, are separated out. So like you can convert. And then um, this one looks like it's how to optimize latency and one to op optimize throughput. So we're going to run each of these notebooks and try them separately. Well, we'll see how many we get through. I don't know if we'll get through all of them, but we'll we'll see how far we get. Um, but you don't have to do that separately. Like you can do it all together from what I understand about Olive. But since I'm new to Olive and I, I'm just learning, I like that it's pieced out and kind of lets me try different features. So we're going to go with that. So if I go back here, goodness, this is so small. Let me make this bigger. So now I'm just in my Azure Machine Learning Studio. Let's remove that, that might help a little bit. And I've done a couple things already. Um, one thing I have done is, uh, is this scrolling? Okay. Is I have already um, installed, or I've already downloaded the source. So I've already cloned the Olive repo um, into my, um, resource. I'm using the compute instances. Um, and I'll just show that quickly. If I go to compute instances, um, you can see I've created this one and I'm just in the terminal. And then I'm also going to use the notebook. So I'm leveraging the, um, the, uh, cloud, cloud, uh, compute here and the pre-configured environments within it. So we will still have to install all of them. So um, I've grabbed this. The other thing I've grabbed is this. Um, I've downloaded the wheel that we need to install, that we need to pip install into our environment. So if we go, this is the um, notebook. Why is my dark mode not on? 
I guess actually it's probably easier for you to see in this. So we'll leave it in, in light mode. Um, but anyway, so this is one of the, the notebooks for converting with Olive. Um, and so that's what we're going to try first. So the first thing I need to do is pip install this wheel that we just downloaded. And the download is here. I've just already downloaded it into my environment. Make sure I'm in the right spot. Oh, I need to go to notebook. Uh, to oh, looks like my, let me see, can I move, let's move myself to the side. Actually, that's even worse because then it's super small. Well, can I scroll this? Nope, I can't. Well, I'm just going to remove myself for a minute. Actually, let's try this one. Is that any better? Nope, it's not. All right, well, I'll just tell you what I'm doing. <laughs> so I'm just now in the directory um, that has the wheel that I need to install. And I'm just going to paste in the pip install wheel. Um, and actually, I just did that without selecting my conda environment first. So I think that might go globally. But let's see if I um, can run this. I think I might have to go back and select my conda environment. So what conda environment am I using? We'll use the 3.8 PyTorch and TensorFlow. Um, so let's run this and see if my, my pip install worked. Even I think that does it globally if I don't like, select the environment. Suspense. Nope. Okay. Let's go back and, and select our environment. So I'm going to list my environments. Oh, I spelled list wrong. That, that's not going to work. Okay. activate. I think we did, we did Azure ML, UI, Python, and PyTorch, and TensorFlow. Oh, and then I forgot Conda. Again. Okay, now we're in the right environment. Now let's try this install. Is there, there might be some conflicts we were talking about with the Azure container um, for PyTorch and the conflicts and things. Let's see if that worked. I don't think, I don't know if it did. Sometimes when there's an issue, it still works and sometimes it fails. We'll have to try a different environment or maybe create a new one. Um, Oh, nope, that worked. Okay, fantastic. So let's, um, so this first cell here is uh, downloading um, our model and example data that we'll need in order to convert. So rather, like if you were doing using this on, you know, model that you're already working on, uh, you would have already have your model and you already have your sample data that you would use. But since we're just kind of running this example, um, this uh, tutorial provided it for us. And we can confirm that that is downloaded by going back over here and taking a look. Where did it go? Oh, there it is, conversion example. <laughs> it's right there. Okay, so now we have this model and we have the, let me turn on my zooming here because this is just small, even with having it, um, so uh, scrolled in. I use Zoom it. I don't know if anybody else has used Zoom it, but it's fantastic. Um, and let's see. So now I should be able to. There we go. That is so much better. And then I can draw on things too, which is fun. And I can make like little smiley faces. I could draw a cat as well. 
the, the less useful things. But see, this is why you need Zoom it, because then you can do things like draw cats on your picture. OK. So we now have our um, sample downloaded. That was so lovely um, included in this notebook. Um, so there's different configurations that you need to set, right? Which shows here. So where's the model path? And this has a nice little table that shows you what each one is. Um, so the path to the model, the input schema and output schema. So with Onyx Runtime, um, when you uh, serialize a model and then you go to use it, you need to know what the input and outputs will be. And so that's what the schema is providing. The offset is the different operation sets. Um, so there's different ones that are supported at different versions. So you want to use the highest one that is uh, supported for your model. You want to give it a name, um, your sample data, and then which model framework you used. So this is um, all of the parameters that you need to set in this configuration. And um, here is what they are for this one. So this is our model path, our input schemas. So this is what it's expecting. And this is the output. Any questions yet? I'm not seeing any in here. Oops. All right, well, then I will just keep going. Um, so I think now when I run this, let's see if we're going to have this without any issues. So now it's running. So it's going to grab that model. It's going to um, convert it for me. And they want to know our feedback about the notebook experience. Should we complete the survey? I super love the notebooks in Azure ML. Um, and I like that they're all pre-configured. Uh, I also use Jupyter Notebooks and Anaconda, Anaconda like locally as well. So it really just depends on what I'm working on. Sometimes I use the notebooks in here. Sometimes I use them in VS Code locally. Um, oh, no, we have our first error. Let's see. We need to install TF2 Onyx. OK. Oh, uh, let's go back here and install TF2 Onyx. Hmm, saying we already have it. Let's try again. Might need to refresh. Oh, it looks like we got further because I don't think it got to this converting step. So while that converts, actually, I want to show you something. So when it comes to um, convert model to Onyx, Kind of show you like why this is easier than what it normally would be. Um, well, this is with PyTorch. So the thing is, is like the first thing when you're converting a model to Python or to Onyx um, is you need to know what framework you trained with, and then based on what framework you trained it with, depends on how you would convert it. And so what this does is it's taking away like okay, I have to think about how I do it with TF Lite or um, you know TensorFlow or PyTorch and all that, and it's just saying just tell me what framework you used, and I will do the rest for you. So there's a good doc that I thought showed kind of all of the tool, different um, tools for converting to Onyx. So we could look at, so this is the TensorFlow one, but there's one that just lists out all of the different conversion tools that I want to show you. And I'm not, of course, I'm not finding it. Here, I think it's this one, Onyx ML tools. Ah, OK, this is what I was thinking of. Now I have my super zoom tool. So these are all of the different um, things you might use to convert your model to Onyx. Um, now, this one, I think, is focusing on you know, TensorFlow and uh, PyTorch, because it looked like those were the options that we could choose from. Right? Like, did it give other options? But I thought it just said TensorFlow and PyTorch, which are going to be more where these um, optimizations are going to be useful anyways for a deep learning model. Where was that? Let's go back here. OK. 
yeah, so currently supported are PyTorch and TensorFlow. I wonder um, if they're gonna keep adding, but that's cool. I know they are working um, to continue to add features to this. All right, let's go back here. Did it work? Oh, what's, what's our error? Did I need to refresh my kernel? No, okay, let's see. Conversion failed. Model TensorFlow has no attribute session. So I'm guessing that'd be like ORT session. Um, so TF session. Okay, let's keep going. This was a tensor, yeah, it was a TensorFlow model. I'm wondering if this is a version issue. I wonder what version of TensorFlow has let's let's search this. I bet there's a. I bet I need to um, install a specific version of TensorFlow. Oh, Stack Overflow. What will we do without this? Hmm. So you must be using TensorFlow too, which does not use session anymore, but rather greedy execution. Um, okay, so let's figure out what version of TensorFlow we have and what version we need to install. And you're not really doing machine learning until you run into packaged version issues, right? <laughs> okay, how do I get the TensorFlow version? I think, do I have Copilot on here? Um, I don't think I do. So is it just we want to import... Enter low as TF, right? And then, oh, let me see. I want to do TF. Okay. And then let's do TF dot. It's usually like underscore ver, right? Isn't that like urgent? Yeah. Okay. Let's try that. Okay. So we were using 291. I love the uh, IntelliSense that I get now within my notebooks. When I first started doing this, there was not IntelliSense, and I came from a C Sharp background, and I greatly missed my IntelliSense, so I'm very glad to see that. Okay, but we're on 291. What version do we need to install in order to have session? Was it just one? Is that what it said? Yeah, I am not sure. Okay, so to get TF1X um, like behavior, you need to run. Okay, that disable V2 behavior. I'm gonna try this um, and see if this does what we need. So it says if I import, I probably need to install this. I have never had to do this. This gets the most upvotes, and like I feel like Stack Overflow isn't gonna lie to me, right? Basic GI is saying don't, <laughs> it will ruin it. <laughs> okay, well, let's see what else is here. Um, TF2 eager execution by default. This removes the need for session. If you want to run a static graph, the more proper way. Oh, so you can still access it using tf.v1 session in TF2. Now, I don't know if, can I just run this? And then will that update my environment or does that need to be part of the book itself? Let's, let's try it. I don't know. Um, let's add a code cell. Oops, run that. Okay, let's try this again.
Yeah, I think that actually has to be part of of the like source. So I think that we need to actually downgrade our tensor. Like that's what I would do. I don't know about this run compatibility mode thing. Okay, let's see here. Um, I think I really just need to install the right package or I mean, this gets the most upvotes. Why is this linking to a spreadsheet? <laughs> Not clicking that. Um, I wanna search this. I wanna know more about what this is. I think this is what we want. Let's look, this is TensorFlow. So let's look at TensorFlow, see what they say. Okay, bring in all the public TensorFlow interfaces into the map. I'm gonna I'm gonna install this. I think this is what we want to do. It gets the most upvotes. And I think that if we run this and then run our conversion, um, then I think it'll work. Or at least it'll solve this issue. So do I just pick install? I mean, just gonna make sure is this the is that the install that we want? Is just tensorflow.compat v1 or is it tensorflow.compat? Like, what is my install here? Or should that already be in my. No, because it looked like it didn't. Well, let's try running it. I don't think it recognized it as installed. Let's try it. I think I have to install it, don't I? Oh, wait, no, I didn't. It didn't have to install it. Okay. Well, let's try this again now. Hmm. That didn't solve it, did it? I'm wondering if this needs to, oh no, that's not gonna matter. Try one more, even though it's not gonna work. And then I think we just have to downgrade, which is fine. I wonder if it's the model that's doing. Um, let's see, where is this actually failing at? The base converter, TensorFlow converter. Let's see. Yeah, no, this is part of the Olive conversion TensorFlow converter. So I think that we'd actually need to put this in. Do I have the source in here? I don't want to compile a new version. Okay, let's. Yeah, I think the best thing we can do is install TensorFlow v1. So I think what we need to do is back up here. If I was in the actual Python file, I think that would work. For some reason, updating this just in my um, my environment isn't working. Although, did I try refreshing my environment? I didn't. Let's try that. I don't think that will work, but it's worth a try, right? Let's get rid of this and get rid of that. And...
Oh, oops, I didn't need to rerun that, but it doesn't hurt. And then get olive, set the compatibility. Really wish it would work just letting me set it in my notebook versus in the script. Conversion example. Oh, did I? Hang on. No, it's not finding this, but it is here. Oh, you know what? I didn't. No, I did run this. Didn't I? Let me. Okay. Let's run this because we need this conversion example variable. Run here, run the compatibility, and try this again. Okay. Oh, we got we got so I had to I had to refresh. Interesting. Now let's see what are we on? What's our next issue? <laughs> okay. Oh wait, no, 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 it didn't. It's still failing. Okay. Downgrade, we go. Did anybody say? downgrade or is everyone saying yeah this can pat but that we're not going to update the source for this we are just going to so after 115x there should be no other one x okay so i think we can do this i think this is what we need to do or let's look at yeah, let's look at what the latest version is. Well, the latest of one. Yeah, so 115.5. Um, let's just pip install this. Let's go back to our environment. Okay, we still have. Did not find a version that satisfies the requirement. Why are those all two? Hmm, let's see. So we don't want to upgrade though, we're downgrading. Well, let's try this one. See if that command works better. Nope, so we can't downgrade. Why wouldn't pip have the ability? Oh, thank you, Kevin. So Kevin says it looks like it only runs with Python 3.7, and so we are on a 3.8. So we'd have to redo, I think we'd have to create an all-new environment then on a lower version of Python. I don't think I have a 3.7. There's a 3. Um... Well, I think we should just try a new, let's try one of the other um, optimization ones because I think we know what our issue is here. But if I, we only have 15 minutes left and if I go back and recreate the environment and then run this, I don't think that's as fun as trying out one of the other notebooks, what do you think? <laughs> okay. So we have another notebook here. Let's take a look at what a, the other ones are. Um, also, I will take this this back to the team and, and have them take a look at it and see. It could be that I'm doing something wrong or maybe it's the model itself, um, but it looks to me it looks like the, the file itself um, in the conversion is actually calling session, like because it's calling TF session in the TensorFlow Python converter, which is part of Olive, and this isn't available in our version. So it looks like it is something that needs to be updated within the Olive package. So looks like a bug to me. So let's move forward. Let's look at this one. All right, so. We will stay in our kernel here. I want to 
look at something in environments. We're going to come back here in a second because with the environments, I'm wondering if, like they said, we can't use these in instances because it's like if I could use a PyTorch Python, like if there was a, a different pre-configured environment, I could just grab quick. That would be super useful because um, like with AML, you have um, these different environments. You know, these are the pre-configured ones that. Um, are set up to use, but there isn't an actual 3.7, so we'd have to create it. I guess we could go through the CLI too. I don't know, I, I kind of want to fix this. Should we, uh, anybody have an opinion? Should we, should we try the um, model latency notebook? Or should we set up a 3.7? Python 3.7 environment with TensorFlow 1.15 in order to convert our model. No opinions? Okay, well, we already have this installed. So, oh, it looks like there's some additional installs we need here. So we've done this as part of our prereqs on the first notebook. And then, so install Onyx Runtime with pip install extra. This, this is like a special, a special Onyx Runtime for OpenVINO. Extra index URL, okay, well, let's, oh, for CPU or GPU, we are gonna be using GPU. So let's install this one. set up and then I have way too many things open right now to find what I need. Okay, I can close this now and I can close this. Did I paste this blog in? I'm going to paste this again just because I'm not sure if I pasted it into the chat, but just in case. Okay, successfully installed. Woohoo! And then download the example model. Okay, so now we're gonna run this and we should see our example model show up over here in the optimization example. So this is the TensorFlow BERT for question answering Onyx model. So this is the model. This is a model that's already been converted. It's an open source model um, that anyone could go use. And I think I need to refresh this. Fantastic. Okay. So now we have optimization example and it includes this model. Can you see that? So there is our TF for BERT questioning. And so that part's good. So now to optimize, let's look at. So this is going to be it's going to be a lot, a lot more configuration here for optimization. So let's take a look what this includes. OK, so first, obviously, so the configuration is what we put in our optimization config, all these different parameters that we're sending in, right? Um, so we need to have our model, obviously. So this would be after we had converted it to Onyx. And we'll just pretend like we already did that. Um, but we're using this PyTorch BERT model. Actually, I think it was TensorFlow. Um, and then what is this one? Whether the Onyx Runtime package is built with OpenMP, we need our result path. We need, um, so again, our input um, spec. So these are the inputs for um, the BERT question answering. Then our output is obvious is our scores. So that would be our result. And that's the name. So that's the name of the output. Oops. I always do this when there's markdown in uh, notebooks. I don't know if other people do this, but I'll double click on something and that actually goes into the markdown cell. Hmm. Okay. Our providers. So if we want CPU or DNML.
Um, so these are different, all these different optimizations. I don't think we need to go through all of them. Um, oh, bye, Kevin. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, we only have another 10 minutes, so you, you made it through almost all of it. You got the exciting errors. Got to hang out with us for the, the errors. Okay. Uh, let's see. So then, oh, there's transformer arguments. Okay. So if you're, we're using a BERT, so I'm guessing that will be included in ours since it's a BERT model, right? Let's see what they have here. So we have our Onyx model. I feel like I should run this because I want to know if it's going to work. And then we'll go back and look. But these are like all of the options that you have. These are not all required. Um, that's another good thing to, to say. Oh, look at no module. OK, so we need to install this. Assuming I can just pip install this. I'm not familiar with this. Minimal perf long, yeah. OK. Although this says CV. This one did not. I wonder if there is a difference. Let's go to the GitHub. Okay. Well, this is actually interesting because I didn't I didn't know what this is. It's called Load Gen, and it's a reusable module that efficiently and fairly measures the performance of inference system. So I'm guessing this is probably going to help us understand what things are working better than others. Um, so let's see if I can just do this back to my compute here. I need to do that dash CV. Let's see if it works. Yeah, no. Okay. So I need this as my pip install, I believe. Oh, no. Did not find a version that satisfies, satisfies the requirements from versions none. All right. Well, let's see how we install this thing. That's not working. Did I miss a step in the prereqs? Let's just make sure I didn't miss something. Yep. So this is for benchmarking. So that's interesting. Like, that's the thing is it has all these different packages in there that will be using. How do I install you? Um, is there an issue with this package? This is a relatively, no, it's closed. Okay. Let's go back to Normally, I might have tested all of this out and solved all the issues before we went live. Today, we get to do it together, which I feel like is more fun. Okay, this could be what we want. Let's take a look. Nope, maybe. Wait. Let's see. I don't think that's right. <laughs> Has anyone else used this before? Used this package before? ML perf logen. Now I thought I found it right away. Did I not? Look at the GitHub. Uh, well, they have some demos. Maybe they include um, install. This is definitely the right source. Where is your get started? Let's go back again.
So here's the overview, which was super helpful. Um, build instructions maybe, but I thought we could just like pip install. So here's a quick start. We might have to, isn't there a wheel or something? Okay, here's a wheel. Okay, so we need to clone this repo, then go to the wheel location, it appears, run the setup, and then install the wheel. I wish they just made the wheel available somewhere. But I don't think they do. I think we have to do this. Um, I think this is already, okay. Well, I'm gonna do some side-by-side -side here so that I can follow this quick start. So first we're going to install this. All right, now we are going to clone. The repo. Oh, and then I also added the CD. Let's see if that works or if I have to go find it. So I feel like even though there's all these steps, like it's still probably quicker than figuring out the parameters um, yourself. But we'll see. I don't know that we're actually, we only have four minutes left. So I don't know that we're actually going to get to complete this demo or this uh, experiment, I should say. But we'll see how far we can get. Okay. Still waiting on that clone. And it looks like. I should talk a little bit about what's coming up next. So on September 23rd, we'll have the latest from Intelligent Recommendations. I wonder, is that like, I don't even know what that is. What is Intelligent Recommendations? Let's, let's look that up while we're waiting. Sounds really cool. It sounds like probably some sort of a like reinforcement learning uh, type of, let's see like customizing like an experience, um, probably through a service, that's really cool. Well, that looks like it'll be interesting. So it calls out to the API based on the data and looks like it makes intelligent recommendations. Well named, okay, let's go back. Are we cloned yet? Almost, we're almost there. We're almost out of time. Well, even if we don't get to finish out these, um, this Olive Onyx Go Live, it was still pretty cool to kind of like look at, look at it, learn a little bit more about what it does, you know, try it out a little bit. Even if we had issues, like I feel like that's normal. I feel like every time I go and clone something and try to play around with it, there's always different configurations and things that. Um, need to happen in order to get things to work. So I feel like that's pretty, pretty standard. However, um, it'd be really cool. So like in the blog, they actually show um, what they were able to do. And since I hadn't played with this yet, you know, I hadn't, I didn't know all of the different configurations that I would need to do in order to get it to work. But it's been a good learning process. I feel like um, seeing, seeing how it works, what different libraries it's using. It's kind of neat to see this load gen library that I didn't know about for um, benchmarking, which is probably useful in its own right. Well, I think we're out of time before this is even going to finish cloning. So I think we'll just end here. Um, thanks everyone for hanging out with me today. I always like uh, filling in for Seth. Um, so we will see you next time on the AI show.